to give you a bit about the board. So our board is a public-private partnership. It brings together the key stakeholders involved with workforce or workforce-related uh, uh, services, including uh, the private sector, which is uh, the majority of our board members, uh, represents some labor, education, uh, and other stakeholders involved in the public system. And we oversee the workforce development system in, in southern Worcester County, so 38 communities, Worcester and surrounding communities in, in southern Worcester County, to really make sure that the workforce is prepared for the jobs that are available and helping business to grow and thrive. So again, I want to welcome you all here today. I'm going to turn it over, I think, now to John, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, some business services at Workforce Central Career Center, which is one of three career centers uh, under the purview of the board here in Central Mass. So, John? I just want to say thank you so much uh, you know, for being here today. Um, you know, again, I'm John McCarthy, a business service rep at Workforce Central Worcester. And I uh, want to thank everybody for you know, responding to the emails that I sent out and um, uh, you know, welcome you to the Workforce Investment Board. Um, I think, as you know, Workforce Central is a um, you know, partnership of the Worcester City Manager's Office of Workforce Development and the State Department of Career Services, um, whom I work with, uh, my colleague Mike. Um, I, I think a lot of times when people are thinking about the career centers um, and about our business services, people think of staffing first off. And that is a big part of my plan um, when I come out and you know, build my relationships with local businesses. But there are other aspects to what we do. Um, I always tell people, think of me as a generalist. If there's a question that you have, if there's an issue um, you know, that you need to overcome with your business, I probably have a connection, either through a city agency, state, federal agency, or even a nonprofit agency that might be able to help you with that. Um, so please feel free to contact me with whatever your business needs might be, and I'd be happy to point you in the right direction and work on a creative solution for you. Um, this morning, um, you know, of course, Mike Corcoran is our, our headline speaker, but um, I would like to introduce um, my colleague Ethan Brown. Uh, one of our very best career counselors uh, upstairs at Workforce Central Worcester. Ethan wants to give you um, a, a brief presentation on an on-the-job training uh, program that we've been operating at the Career Center for about three years now. Yeah. yeah. And I'm um, going to hand the floor over to Ethan, and um, you'll get thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Good morning. Um, I have some handouts here that's going to pass out. You don't necessarily need those to follow along with uh, information you're about to give you. Kind of gives, it's a frequently asked question sheet, so some of the more basic questions people have about the OJT program are in there, okay? And I won't be before you long. Try to be mindful of your time. But I do appreciate John um, inviting me and let me speak here. So uh, the main function of my job is I am a career counselor here. Uh, the majority of the time I'm spending working with individuals to uh, see if they can benefit some type of training, and then what training that is, so we put together a training packet. Can everybody hear me back there? Okay, good. Thank you, Jeff. You're the, you're the you're my sounding board, okay? Um, but the other part of what I do is I'm the OJT on-the-job training coordinator for Central Massachusetts. Um, really what the OJT program is, is really kind of to fill a skill gap. Um, you, we may have clients coming through our three career centers who may not necessarily need training, a complete training program, um, but they could probably benefit from some skills, some very short uh, kind of a distance between where they are and where they want to be, or the skill gap. And um, what the program does is it helps fill that skill gap. So if you have an individual with the basic requirements for a particular position, but there may be something along the lines of a cert certification or some training that they're going to need that don't necessarily need to go to a school for, that's what the OJT comes in. Um, it can be catered to just about any business. Um, Length of the OJ, OJT varies, okay? I've done them as short as six, uh, four weeks and as much as six months, all right? All depends on the skill set that um, that individual has, where they've started as far as skills, and then how much they need to learn in order to be proficient in that job, okay? So that amount varies. The benefit to the um, potential client or employee coming through our career center is these are full-time jobs, okay? Part of the requirement of the program is when we do partner with businesses to do the OJT, they must agree uh, that these are full-time positions, okay? Um, that these positions are ones that were created just for the program, so they more than likely already existed. You just didn't have anyone to fill in. Um, also, too, 
the pay, okay? So whatever, basically whatever you would give someone who walked in off the street um, as far as an employment, it's the same exact thing. The only difference is I'm here working with the business, your businesses, to fill that skills gap with that employee, okay? Um, the company gets a reimbursement on the training. Well, we say training, but really it's a reimbursement of the individual's wage. And it can go up to 90%, okay? Um, and these really about the cost of training that individual, where they started and what you have to do to get them to the point of uh, proficiency, which means their ability to do the job without direct supervision, okay? So it varies. Usually I try to focus on smaller companies, especially if you're new to the program, new um, to something along the lines. There's a lot of paperwork, but the good part is you don't see a lot of it because I do it, okay? Um, but so most of the companies I do work with, they're smaller, but it, does, it doesn't necessarily mean I can't work with larger companies. When you're thinking about requirements for this position, uh, for the OJT program, the positions, uh, first the individual has to have the baseline qualifications. That's what we ask for. Um, the OJT portion does not circumvent any type of hiring process that you ha may have. So if you do drug screens, background checks, Corey checks, things of that nature, that still takes place, okay? Um, we try to focus on candidates coming through the career centers, all right? Individuals who may be eligible for the program, they need to have collected um, what's called dislocated worker or long-term unemployed, so they need to have collected at least 22 weeks of unemployment after January of 2008. Most people do. That's one of the requirements, okay? Also, too, we have an academic and a career-based assessment that they both have to pass, okay? And then finally, I actually sit with them and I conduct an interview with them. So before they even get to the employer, um, I've actually gone through the kind of a proving process to make sure not only are they qualified for the program, but they're a good fit for the OJT, okay? Um, I work with the companies, as I said before, you know, we actually put together a packet as far as hiring and, and how we go about finding the candidates that we need. Um, I've worked really, really well with companies. What I do is not invasive, okay? I try to do it in a way that's gonna continue to work for the company, not interrupt any things that you may have to do. Um, occasionally, we will need to sit down and kind of talk about what you're looking for, but the most important part is what that skill gap is. Okay. What is it that they're missing and what is it that they can get by going through the OJT program? I, I stress that because a lot of times companies are really looking at, oh, this is, this is great, I get reimbursement on this individual wage. Um, and it's like really about getting them into position, but what about after the OJT is over? Okay. The idea is to use OJT as a springing, as a kind of a stepping stone to get the, that employee where you want them to be. Okay. Um, as far as the companies, there's a very basic process that I do go through, but it is required. I do look at tax records, uh, health insurance, um, workman's comp, things of that nature. Nothing that's invasive, uh, but we need to make sure that when we are connecting with the employers, that the, the, in addition to the candidate being um, appropriate, the company or the employer needs to be appropriate for the program as well, okay? So one of the big things, you are never confused. You never not know. I walk with you throughout this step, through the whole process. And as I said before, Unlike some of the other career centers um, who may have two or three people that do it, I do it. So I really have some leeway into how we can work with the people, okay? And work with those positions, work with those individuals, all right? So the benefit to the company, again, is you're getting a qualified candidate um, in this full-time positions. The benefit to our client coming through the career center is that we get them back to work, and that's what everyone's looking for. And then here for the career center, um, in addition to getting a placement through that individual going back to work, a portion of the OJT supplants my salary. So the more money we can make doing OJT, the more money we can put somewhere else and keep someone else employed or, or towards another program. Um, that's kind of the basics um, that I have for you guys. There is a sheet going around with all the information on it. These are just frequently asked questions. I try not to get too deep into it because it could be a lot and it really needs to be, be digested in pieces, not like consumed. So, um, I think that's pretty much the basics, unless anyone have any questions specific regarding the program. I do. Yes. What's the breakdown of monet monetary returns in terms of percentages? Size of company, certain percentage? Um, no. The way the reimbursement <coughs> breaks down, well, yes, to some extent, you're absolutely right. Um, it's based on, kind of the way it breaks down is, if you, I believe, if, it, you, if you have one to 50 employees, uh, that's a 90% reimbursement rate. 51 to 250 is 75, and then 251 and up is 50, all right? Um, it's more attractive 
obviously to use smaller companies because there is a larger uh, percentage that you'll get back, but you know, it, it doesn't have to be. When you're thinking about companies, I'm not thinking about the company overall. So it may have a number of different franchises. To base that percentage of reimbursement, it's about the number of employees in that particular site. So you may have a number of different you know, franchises, but at this one, five people work here. So it's based on that number, okay? Um, one of the things too, kind of got me thinking about, when you're, when you're looking at this, um, people always say, well, how long is it gonna take to get an employee? The process is pretty much the same as if you were um, reaching out to someone not through the OJT program. So whatever your process is, it's pretty much the same. The good, the benefit is that I screen individuals. So I'm never gonna send somebody to you who you think might not be appropriate, okay? I really work with the company to kind of get them, what are you looking for? What are the basic skills that you're looking for? And, what, and you know, some of the intangibles, um, you know, personality, things of that nature. They work well in teams. So I go through that, a lot of that with them. I usually spend about a week to a week and a half getting him through the process. Um, it's obviously a lot shorter, perhaps someone who has more of the skills, but you know, I try to make sure that I'm not sending you candidates that, that you, know, you, you really don't need uh, or don't fit the type of opportunity that you're trying to create with your company. Um, so I'll actually go through them, I'll do all the uh, requirements, all the requirements for the program, um, and then I'll pass them on to whoever is responsible for interviewing them. And then once we've agreed that this is the person is appropriate and we want to bring them on, an offer is made, and then we sit down and we look at that skill gap. So where are they starting and what do they need to learn? And through that, with that uh, process, we actually create a training plan <coughs> with that individual. So to dictate the responsibilities, things that they're going to learn, things that they need to do, expectations of the company and the employee, the length of the OJT, and then also the reimbursement rate for that particular OJT. And then I monitor you, monitor the company and the candidate throughout that process. Jeff, you had a question. Yeah, so it works that way, but it, I think it, in reading this, it also works that if a company has some candidates yep. in mind that are eligible for the program, they could actually kind of reverse, they could send them to you yep. to qualify for the program. So they could actually, if someone comes in their door off the street, so to speak, mm -hmm. who they want to hire, who is also eligible for the program, they could refer them back to you, him or her back to you, to go through the paperwork on the candidate end, yep. and then they could get reimbursed for someone they were conceivably going to hire off the street. Mm -hmm. It's called a reverse referral. Um, okay. Thank you for bringing up, I was just gonna talk about it, but this is a good point. Um, we normally, we, we do look at the candidates who come to the career centers, but we do have, as Jeff said, a reverse referral. So if you have a candidate that you're interested in, as long as they meet the criteria for the OJT program, they can be hired. Now, what I would say is you cannot rehire someone. So for example, you let someone go, and then you discover, hey, listen, OJT looks good. I want to bring Jeff back to the same position. You cannot do that. It needs to be a different position if it's someone that was let go from the company previously. Um, but if you do have a candidate, someone you'd be interested in, and you think the OJT program would be a good fit to connect them, um, we can do what's called a reverse refer. I actually just did an OJT in Fitchburg for a shipping and receiving manager, and he was a reverse referral. And the company found him. I put him through the process for OJT eligibility, and then you know he, he completed all the steps he needed to complete, and they brought him on. We're actually running a six-month OJT with him right now. So, um, those are the basics. Obviously, there's a lot more, but I don't want to take up your time. Um, those are the frequently asked questions. My contact information. Um, is on the last sheet. I also have some business cards I'm going to kind of leave here for anyone who is interested in talking about the program. Um, and as I said before, this is just some brief information, but I can go a little bit more into detail. The key, and this is the final thing I'll say, the key is making sure that the OJT program is the right fit for the company, um, and also that candidate is the right fit for the company as well. So that's really, there are a lot of things that I do, but that's like the bulk of what I, cause I want. I want to make sure that we're connecting with organizations that can benefit from this, that see this as a great opportunity, uh, get a candidate back to work. Uh, so the fit, just like in your regular hiring process, the fit is the most important part. All right. I want to thank everybody. Um, again, you have your handouts. I have some business cards here uh, in case anybody wants to talk to in detail. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the Workforce Training Fund Program.
And again, um, I, the sign out sheet, sign up sheet will allow me to get to John, who I work with, and I'm going to have John be the conduit for this PowerPoint presentation. Because what has happened along the way with the Workforce Training Fund program is it's been changing. There's been increased grant activity. There's also been increased money on some of these grants. So I had this thing printed the end of last week, and then before I could get anything printed again, changes were made in the program. We put some more money on the table, which I'll explain to you when we get to that portion of the PowerPoint. But I always say, well, they didn't take it away. They added money, so that's a good thing. So. Okay, let's see, is this going to work? I hope so. Okay, what I'm going to cover here are the mission and priorities of the Workforce Training Fund program and the grants available. It's going to be an overview. Right? You can ask questions all along the way, which is fine. Um, I'm here afterwards to finish any coffee dregs that are left in the pot. I haven't exceeded my speed limit yet of 15 cups in a day, so I'm doing okay. So I'm ha also happy to take phone calls at any time. You have my business card. Call my cell, don't bother with my office number, I'm on the road five days a week. My job is to travel the state, do breakfast, lunch, and dinners, drink a lot of coffee, talk to people, the best job in the world, really, this is not a bad job, and talk to people about the program, why I want you to access this grant dollars. There's got to be a program here by the time I get through that you can make use of in your company. So the main priority about the Workforce Training Fund program is pretty straightforward. Increasing the skills of your workforce and in turn, allowing your company to improve or change, become more competitive, correct issues or problems in your company to help you sustain your business in Massachusetts, to grow or simply stay even in this economic climate. So, and it costs money to train. And so the grant program is here to help you defray those costs of training. So companies in Massachusetts who have Massachusetts workers can avail themselves of these grants. There is only one grant that deals with a residency issue, and I'll get to that in a second. But if a company is owned by a company out of state or out of the country, I don't care. They can make use of most of the grants here in terms of the money available, except for one, in terms of um, training Massachusetts residents. 1998, this was enacted into legislation. We have done $300 million since this program started in 1999. I've been with the program since its inception. Employers pay unemployment every quarter. They hate the bill. They get the bill, they curse at the bill, they use language they wouldn't use ordinarily in, in mixed company, and then they pay the bill and they say, I don't want to think about this again until the next quarter. All right? However, what a lot of companies don't know is contained within that bill is a surcharge of $8.40 a year on each of your employees, or $2.10 a quarter. It is a surcharge tax on a tax. Way to go, Massachusetts. All right, got to love this state. But the beauty of this program is this. This $8.40 allows you to access training for both full and part-time employees of up to $250,000 at $8.40. So if you've got five people in your company or your IBM, you can access these grants and get these training dollars for this $8.40. The money is now in a trust fund which means the money gets collected and is taken out of a general fund. For years it was in the general fund. This created all sorts of issues and problems. And since I'm being taped, I'm going to be very careful about what I say about our state legislators. Thank you for putting it in the trust fund so the money's not disappearing anymore at the end of the fiscal year. I don't think I'll get fined for that, Jeff. So, no, but what they've done is a good thing. They realize the value of this program. And the problem was in an accounting situation, you got money coming in from all these different areas, and where is the workforce training fund money? It is now in a separate trust fund. It goes into the fund, it goes only into the fund, it comes out of the fund and goes to businesses. What doesn't get spent in a fiscal year stays in the fund, it doesn't go away. If somebody doesn't use all their money, which sometimes happens, it goes back into the fund. So this is a real true business um, situation in terms of here's a set amount of dollars for a specific thing and we're going to use it and that's what it's used for. So this was a real good deal. We collect close to 21 million dollars a year. Right? This is where I say ladies and gentlemen I'm having trouble getting rid of 21 million dollars. Okay? Who would believe that? But if you think about the economic climate, you're running a business, all the things you do to keep operation every single day and I was in a business myself, I worked 30 years in the private industry before I went to work for the state I always describe it as like Alice in Wonderland going down the rabbit hole. What a difference it is. But this is a great program because it's really business friendly. Right? So 
I know a lot of people don't do training because they say they don't have the time to do it, but your competitors are using this money. So you really do want to take a look at these grant opportunities. So every company in Massachusetts is eligible. What you're going to need and from a compliance, and I kind of cover this so you know up front, if you're going to apply for a grant, you don't get stuck in the process because all these grants are rolling applications. You can apply anytime you want. But we do a compliance check. So you need to get a certificate of good standing from the Mass Department of Revenue. There'll be a picture of it in one of the pages coming up. It's, you get it online. I just need a copy of it. It's good for six months. It just tells us you're compliant with state taxes. The horror story was when we didn't do this, a company got a $180,000 grant. I sent them their initial check to start training, and the revenue department took it. So I get a phone call. They're saying, where's my money? I finally found out the revenue department took it. Why? They owe back taxes. That was a real nightmare. So we get this now. If you have this, you don't owe any taxes. If you do owe taxes, they won't give it to you. You square that away, and as soon as it's squared away, you can get your certificate. And again, you need to do it online. It takes only about a week. If you error out three times, like I occasionally do on my computer, more than occasionally, you've got to go snail mail, and it could take a month. So I just, I warn you about that. All the things I talk about today, there's an advisory panel of nine members appointed by the governor. There are union reps on there, nonprofits on there, state agency reps on there. The owner of Legal Seafood is on there. Uh, Mike Woodmere, head of the Taxpayers Foundation, sits on the board. Um, Rick Lord, the president of AIM. Uh, Associated Industries of Massachusetts is on the board. So these policy decisions are getting made. So when I talk about changes in, increased in grant activity and our money for grants, this is how it happens. They meet once a month. All of this information is on the website when they meet, and the meetings are open to the public now. So this is what we talked about, paying into the unemployment. Any nonprofits here? You, do, you need to check on a nonprofit how you pay into the fund. Some nonprofits are what we call self-insured which means you set aside money, and if somebody gets laid off, you actually reimburse the state for the layoff. So you're not paying at $8.40 I talked about, right? Most nonprofits that I deal with are lucky to survive on a week-to-week -week basis. They don't have the wherewithal to set money aside. I'm usually dealing with large nonprofit organizations. Right down here is fine. We check these other things internally. You've got to have workers' comp coverage, as well as the other things we're going to be checking as well. And if there's an issue, well, we simply call you. It's not like, oh, too bad, you can't have any money, there's an issue. Hey, here's the issue, please correct the issue. As soon as it's corrected, let us know, and we'll process your grant. That's what it comes down to. The object of this program is to give money away, not to keep it. I'm going to say that again and again and again. We want to give the money away. I'd like to see us have zero in the account at the end of a fiscal year, because we keep collecting money on a regular basis anyway. That means a lot of people are getting trained. This is the certificate of good standing. That is not. I still get this on occasion. Because if you go back to your office and talk to your controller, he or she will say, I know exactly what you need, and that's the one they're going to get you. It doesn't do us any good. That just states your business in Massachusetts. Okay? How are we doing? Questions so far? What a great job I'm doing. Oh, wow. This is terrific. Okay, so I'm going to cover these grants. Now in the PowerPoint, this is the grant here that, that's changed here, but it's not changed totally when you get to it. We're going to have a higher incentive training grant, an express grant, general program grant, and a technical assistance grant as well, all available to companies. So the higher incentive training grant got changed. So it got changed to, let me back up here. Let me put this, damn, this thing down. <laughs> a higher incentive training grant is dealing with unemployed Massachusetts residents. So this is the only time I talk about a residency situation. All the other grants, they simply need to be working in your company for you to access these training dollars. The object of the higher incentive training grant, you're going to see that this, this stuff isn't really up there, because it, I've got, it's going to change in the PowerPoint, it has been changed. What we're saying to you is this, if you hire a Massachusetts resident, they've been out of work for six months or longer, cost of hiring and training is expensive, we will give you $5,000 to defray those costs when you hire that Massachusetts resident that's been out of work for six months or longer, following 120 days of employment. The application's online and really simple. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes to do. 
You go in, you fill the company name in, you know, who's going to get hired, what's the hire date, do you have a 30-day window of opportunity. If you've hired anybody within the last 30 days, you can access this program right now. <coughs> the other thing that got changed is that we always were talking previously about dislocated workers. All right, so what we're talking about now is if you hire an employee within